Welcome back to Cross-Cultural Communication and Management. This is Topic 3 of the Lecture on the Stereotype and Bias Management. There are three topics in this lecture. We learned from Topic 1 the importance of stereotypes and why prejudices exist. We learned from Topic 2 their consequences in the modern era. Topic 3 will introduce us to some strategies in order to minimize these consequences. Here is our recap. The brain automatically connects the dots to make a triangle. And so stereotype is an oversimplified idea about others. We often stereotype by applying individual to collective level, so to make pattern, to save time and energy. Another way is applying collective to individual level to predict and plan the future. Prejudices are mostly negative stereotype patterns that we have towards other groups. Prejudices are rooted in how humans have evolved to automatically love our in-group more than any other groups. The problem is, the dots in the triangles in our modern era have been increasingly corrupted. For example, we are given and creating dots that are false alarms, and we are creating incorrect patterns based on them, like in the case of Trayvon Martin. Such a stereotype and prejudice can cause threat, leading to a self-fulfilling prophecy, that makes us become what other expect us to be. It is when thought turns into reality, when we act and become the role that is given to us. They can also limit our choice and quality of life. This is because we tend to subconsciously adjust our life in order to be socially accepted. For examples, the consequence of women as homemakers is that each week, their unpaid job at home is 14 hours more than men. More often than not, these stereotypes and prejudices are the drivers of institutionalized discrimination. These could be policies and behaviors that explicitly disadvantage one group, such as the lack of paternal leave, and that maternal leave is much longer than paternal leave. Much more difficult to deal with is institutionalized discrimination that is rooted in subconscious biases because we don't know that we are treating people unfairly. For example, a white sounding name gets more callbacks for interview than an African sounding name with exactly the same CV. So with these consequences in mind, the objective of this topic is to briefly look at ways to minimize them, especially in the workplace. The first step in dealing with the downside of stereotypes and prejudices is to acknowledge that, from the evolutionary point of view, they are important for our own survival, and we are influenced by them. It's pointless to deny it. Here is again, a slide from our previous lecture on nonverbal communication. Because in the past, knowing quickly who are friends and enemies is a matter of life or death, the brain has evolved to decide who is in-group and out-group extremely quickly, based on nonverbal cues such as skin color, age, gender, or even how this person dresses. It take only one-tenth of a second for the brain to make a trust decision. The brain when seeing in-group people activates quite differently from seeing out-group. This in-group bias is automatic, built in for survival. Acknowledging these necessary evils also means we should be ready to call them out when they can be harmful. For example, when a person refers to a manager as a he or refer to a nurse as a she, by default, that's when we should gently point it out. Not only identifying stereotypes in others, we should be ready to face our own tendency as well. The Implicit Association Test is a famous tool from Harvard University, used by millions of people and research projects. The test is based on the principle that the brain reacts quicker to concepts that are closely associated with each other in our mind. Some may argue it shows how racist or sexist we can be. Taking into account some of the criticism, I would not go that far, but I think the test definitely makes the point. Here is a video that explains it in detail. And of course, I encourage you to do the test yourself. Time to discuss the Implicit Association Test, the IAT, which is now the most popular tool for measuring implicit bias. Just to be clear, the test itself, a reaction time measure, isn't the same thing as the underlying construct, implicit bias. It's just a quick and dirty measurement device. 
The best way to understand the IAT is to take a test yourself, which you can do easily and anonymously at Project Implicit. For now, I'll offer a quick synopsis. Understanding the IAT, and indeed all reaction time measures, begins with a basic insight. It's always easier for our brains to sort two concepts together if they are closely associated in our minds. For example, if I say the word dog and ask you to complete this word, you'll be quicker to think cat than bat. Or if I say the word doctor, you will be quicker to think nurse than purse. Armed with this insight, scientists created the IAT, which measures how quickly we sort various pictures and words flash on a computer screen together. Our sorting speed reflects how tightly we associate any two concepts. Quicker sorting means stronger association. The black-white race attitude test, for example, compares implicit attitudes toward two racial categories, black folks and white folks. Each racial category is represented by cropped photos of male faces. To begin, you're asked to sort the faces as quickly as possible. If you see a white face, hit a key to your left, if you see a black face, hit a key to your right. Next, you sort words that represent two attitudinal categories, good and bad. When you see a good word, such as beauty, hit a key to your left. When you see a bad word, such as filth, hit a key to your right. Now the real challenge starts. You're instructed to sort both photos and words, whatever flashes on the screen. For some runs, you are instructed to press the same key for white faces and good words, say on your left, and a different same key for black faces and bad words, say on your right. If you have a more positive association with white folks as compared to black folks, then in this particular arrangement, you will find your groove and fly through the test. Most of us do. But on other runs, which are randomized and counterbalanced, the IAT will give you different directions. Press the same key for white faces and bad words, and another same key for black faces and good words. In these runs, most players can't quite get into a groove, take longer to respond, and make more mistakes by hitting the wrong key. The average time differential between the two arrangements, white plus good as compared to black plus good, is called the IAT effect and reflects the strength of an attitude. On average, we might be a fraction of a second faster pairing white faces with good words than black faces with good words. This means that on average, we have an implicit preference for whites. Over nearly two decades, millions of people have taken implicit association tests hosted by Project Implicit. These tests have measured everything from racial attitudes to gender associations to preferences for one political candidate over another. The results are overwhelming. Implicit biases, measured by reaction times, are systematic and pervasive. They are statistically significant, which means they are not due to chance. On average, our implicit attitudes, which, to remind you, are overall valences toward a category, predictably favor certain groups over others. 80% of participants prefer young over old, 69% thin over overweight, 68% white over black, 76% able-bodied over disabled. Our implicit stereotypes, which are specific trait associations, are also predictable. 72% of participants associate blacks with weapons as opposed to harmless objects. 61% associate Asians with the foreign as opposed to American. 72% associate women with humanities as opposed to math. 76% associate women with family as opposed to career. Pervasiveness does not mean that every single person has the exact same amount of bias. There's wide variability across individuals and groups. For instance, most whites have an implicit preference for whites over blacks, but African Americans show no preference on average. But there's a natural bell curve around that zero average, with about a third of African Americans also showing an implicit attitude in favor of whites over blacks. Unfortunately, no one is immune. But this doesn't mean that we're powerless. To learn more, watch my final video in this series, Lesson 6, Countermeasures. Acknowledging the existence and influence of stereotypes and prejudices does not mean we can't minimize their negative impact. 
The second strategy is training the brain to make it focus on goals. To understand this ability of the brain, let's look at one of the most famous brain injuries in the history. This is Phineas Gage, a railway worker who suffered from a terrible accident in 1843 when an iron rod went straight through his skull, damaging most of his prefrontal cortex. He survived, but the damage changed his personality for the worse. His behaviors became gross, profane, vulgar, impulsive, and uninhibited. The part that was damaged, the prefrontal cortex, is the head office of the brain. It controls our behaviors, self-regulation, goal-oriented actions, and inhibition. When we visit a friend who is sick, it's the prefrontal cortex that makes us say, you look fine, instead of the upset truth, that your friend actually looks awful. And so, it is logical to hypothesize that, the prefrontal cortex can regulate stereotypes, and inhibit the tendency, to automatically follow a pattern. Here is a study, that gives us a hint, of whether the prefrontal cortex can regulate stereotypes. In the experiment, the participants went into the brain scanner with a screen, which shows pairs of faces. They then judged, which face is more likely to be athletic, or more likely for them to befriend. There are pairs of same races, which would be less likely to trigger racial stereotypes, and there is less need for the prefrontal cortex's regulation. But there are also pairs of mixed races, and answering questions of whether this person is likely to be athletic or friend, would trigger racial stereotypes, and so the brain may need to suppress this thought. The finding confirmed the hypothesis. On this graph, you can see that the response time was a little bit slower for the mixed race pairs. The study concluded that, the brain's prefrontal cortex, can conduct a top-down inhibition process, in order to suppress automatic stereotype responses. So stereotypes can be automatic, but the good news is, we can inhibit and suppress them. And the strategy of training the brain to focus on goals is one effective way to do so. In this experiment, while lying in the scanner, participants were shown black and white faces. There were three tasks alternating on the screen. The first task is to categorize if this person is above 21 years old or younger. This is meant to focus on social recognition and trigger stereotypes. The second task is to guess if this particular individual would like a particular kind of vegetable. This is meant to encourage perspective taking. Participants have to think about each face as a unique person. The third task is to do a visual search to see whether there is a dot on the photo. This is meant to ignore racial or social information and just focus on goal. Here is the finding mainly about the activation of the amygdala. This brain region is associated with emotion center, and it is the most sensitive to fear. In the first condition, when black faces appeared on the screen, focusing on social recognition, activated the amygdala more than when white faces appeared. By asking if this person is over 21 years old or not, the question triggers racial stereotypes. Let's compare it with the second condition, in which the participants were asked to think about each face, as a unique individual. By guessing if this person likes a particular kind of vegetable, the amygdala was actually suppressed, when black faces appeared. This task forced people to go beyond stereotypes, in order to see each person as unique. More interestingly, in the last condition, when focusing on goal, the amygdala activation was the same for both black and white faces. Racial information was not that relevant anymore. We can draw many practices from this study, and many other similar ones. Focusing on goals reduces the consequences of stereotypes. I listed here a few quick applications for workplace. For example, using recruitment agents to enhance objectivity. Have a consensus in advance on what success looks like. Having job description with clear and measurable selection criteria. Declare a diversity statement as the organizational goal. Practice name blind selection and promotion process. For hiring and employment, we can diversify the interview panel, standardize interview questions, or record the interview. All these practices will help to focus our brain on goals and distract it from stereotypes. This experiment also reminds us to focus on individuals. When we think of a person as a unique individual, we can push the brain to go past stereotypes. It also suggests that, Perspective-taking 
empathy, and storytelling can all be very useful. The more we come into contact with a person, on a personal and emotional level, the more this person becomes unique, the less of a number, or just a dot in the stereotype pattern. The next strategy is to collect data. It's hard to improve what we can't measure. And the less information we have, the more likely we are to rely on existing patterns or stereotypes. In this study, when women and men are evaluated separately, they score equally. But when they are collectively evaluated, with no specific individual information, especially performance in the past, stereotypes and prejudices kick in. We tend to think that men work harder, being more committed to career, act more like a leader, because the stereotype goes that it's their job. So when evaluation is lumped together, women are rated as less competent, less influential, and less likely to have played a leadership role when they work together with men, especially in male-dominated fields. Based on this study, what we can do is to strive for a clear task structure and KPI when there is a diversity in the same group. This is because the same discrimination could happen to men in female-dominated fields or to other marginalized groups. It is also of utmost importance to continuously update the database of past performance. We should keep frequent surveys, such as employee satisfaction and work records, since this can reveal useful indicators for improvement. I also strongly advise my clients to use artificial intelligence and machine learning to predict the trend and be preventive, something that could be difficult for humans to do. The next strategy is to use counter stereotypes. Thanks to brain's plasticity, stereotype and prejudices are not fixed. We can change them, even switch to the opposite. Here is a very interesting study that shows us how this can be done. Participants in this study were shown pictures and phrases such as, this is Christopher, he is a makeup artist, and this is Rebecca, she is a bricklayer. After that, they conducted a test to find out if their response time to counter stereotypes has changed. The finding is very encouraging, showing a reduction in response time of 225 milliseconds. This means participants have become quicker to accept that it is normal for a man to be makeup artist and a woman to be a bricklayer. All is achieved by just a short exposure to counter stereotype in order to reduce immediate activation of stereotypes. The conclusion is exposing ourselves to counter stereotypes is a very effective strategy. Personally, this is my favorite strategy to deal with my own shortcoming. For many years, these were the photos I kept on my computer's desktop. I took these photos in Oman, where men are expected to carry children. This is a poster in a public hospital and a local market. Every day when I opened my laptop, they reminded me of my incorrect stereotypes about men in the Middle East. And so the applications for this strategy are plenty. For example, we can decorate our office, home, and public space with counter stereotypes. We could meet watch, follow, and read about role models. We could invite them to talk at our company. We could highlight those who defeat stereotypes, put a spotlight on them if they are from the staff. And especially, if we have children, we may want to balance the harmful impact of the media with our own dose of counter-stereotype. Here is one way to do it. This afternoon, we're going to draw people doing different jobs. And the first job we're going to draw is a firefighter. Okay. Have a think in your head what a firefighter looks like. Oh, we What's your firefighter called? Mine's called Firefighter Gary. Firefighter Stan. <laughs> firefighter Simon. He's big and strong. He's got a big helmet on. That's brilliant, isn't it? Next, we're going to draw a surgeon. Have you thought of a name for your surgeon? Jim. Jim Bob. He's a brain surgeon. I think he would wear a stethoscope. He gives you medicine. That's his ambulance. OK, next, we're going to draw a fighter pilot. This is his jet plane. He rescues people. He likes to do stunts in the air and stuff. OK, now, who would like to meet these people for real? Yeah! I'm good. 
Okay, let's rest up. My name's Tamsin and I'm a surgeon in the NHS. My name's Lauren and I'm a pilot in the Royal Air Force. My name's Lucy, I'm a firefighter in the London Fire Brigade. So who wants to know how to do an operation? <gasps> Who's better on? I'm trying my stethoscope. Can we put this in here? What does it look like? There you go. Now you're proper fighter pilot. So into your ears. Can you hear that? Yeah. It's really good. Yeah, it's much better than, yeah, it's much better than the kids Mine's one. Got The last strategy that I would like to mention in this lecture is reshaping the culture around us, becoming not the product, but the producer of our own culture. Here is a fascinating study that shows us the impact of new cultural elements. In this study, participants saw pairs of words on the screen, and they need to answer if these two words refer to a person. Congruent pairs that fit the stereotypes would result in shorter response time and incongruent pairs that confront stereotypes would make the response time longer. The researchers then insert a fake social feedback after each time the participants answer a question. For example, if the participant thinks that mother can't be priest, then the social feedback would be, only 2% of previous respondents agreed with you. But if the answer is yes, the social feedback then encourages this overcome of stereotype by saying, 99% agreed with you. The impact of social feedback is immense, leading to a drop in response time. New cultural elements have encouraged people to reconsider stereotypes because people naturally want to conform to social norms. Being the producer of culture means we can proactively create those new social norms to transform the culture around us. In one of our previous lectures, we learned that nonverbal signals in the surrounding can influence our thinking and behaviors. Let's consider a very famous theory called the broken window theory. Here is the reasoning. When we are in a neighborhood with signs of civil disorders, such as broken windows, we are more likely to engage in antisocial behaviors. After all, people here don't seem to care. This leads to further crime and disorder. With a bit more graffiti, then drug use, then some stealing, then robbing, and this can quickly spiral down to serious crimes. Here is an interesting experiment. Participants were asked to wait for one minute in either of these two rooms, one with typical science and geek stuff, such as Star Trek posters, soda cans, video games, comics, junk food, and technical magazines. The other room was decorated non-stereotypically, with art posters, water bottles, nature photos, and general interest magazines. After sitting just for one minute in non-stereotypical room, more women showed interest in computer science. When made aware of the decoration, more men and women choose to work for companies with non-stereotypical environment. This goes on to show how the surrounding and embedded culture can change our thinking and decision-making. Again, being the producer of culture means we actively change the environment around us, so in turn, it will influence our thinking and behaviors in the direction that we want. The application is plenty. I have seen companies proactively changing the office decor, so to create a friendly environment. Changing buildings' names to honor female scientists, or displaying artworks from artists in marginalized groups. I have seen governments carefully regulating the kind of advertisements on the streets, reconsidering districts' names, or fighting crime by making a neighborhood clean and providing public facilities. The bottom line is, if the surrounding can brainwash us, then we'd better brainwash ourselves. Changing the culture is, of course, more than just skin deep. It requires a change in mindset as well. For example, toys have long been criticized to reflect and reinforce gender stereotypes. Girls are given toys that signify low-paid jobs, taking care of others, being pretty, and waiting for a hero. Boys are encouraged to play engineer and science games, rescuing others, and being a superman. Let's Toys Be Toys is campaign started by a group of parents who see this as harmful for their children. Here in this poster, they pointed out how toys for girls in the 70s 
are not so different from nowadays, although women's role has changed significantly. Let's consider a case study from Toys R Us. This company, used to face many accusations from parents, regarding the way toys are gendered for boys and girls. Responding to criticism, the company not only accepted responsibility, but also transformed the culture of their products and becomes a trendsetter in gender-neutral toy movement. In other words, the company was a product of a culture with gender stereotypes. It has become an active producer to change those stereotypes. We can look at some of their catalogs here to see this change in their marketing strategies. Reshaping a culture can be supported by institutional rules, such as changing the law. For example, as we know from one-child policy in China, by following the law, even enforced behaviors could slowly change the deep-seated value. We have seen how one-child policy was not favored at first, but it has slowly changed the mindset of many Chinese. Another example of using laws to support a change cultural norms is in Finland. When the country voted for an all-female coalition government, one of the first thing these women did was to change the law, giving men the right to equally share 14 months of parental leave. In 2019, Finland became the first country in the world that acknowledges men's equal right in child care. And I wholeheartedly support this law. I certainly think that women can't have it all, if men can't have it all. Acknowledging how media can influence cultural norms and behaviors the UK and Germany now have laws that ban gender stereotypes adverts. Channel 4 even offered £1 million reward for adverts that challenged the stereotypes. The winner is the Royal Air Force recruitment. Their ad featured a female combat officer. I will show the winning ad, followed by another brilliant commercial by Always that went viral when it was released. Lines and wrinkles, I want to combat the signs of aging. Keep strong, healthy hair. What's my secret? With my busy life, I don't have time to slow down. I can't believe we turned up wearing the same thing. I want a lip gloss that can stay on whatever life throws at me. All day protection, now with wings, so I can handle anything. Women should be defined by actions, not cliches. Every role in the RAF is open to everyone, from spare time to the front line. Hi, Erin. Hi. Okay, so I'm gonna just give you some actions to do. I just do the first thing that comes to mind. Show me what it looks like to run like a girl. Oh Show me what it looks like to fight like a girl. <laughs> now throw like a girl. Aww. My name is Dakota and I'm 10 years old. Show me what it looks like to run like a girl. Throw like a girl. Fight like a girl. What does it mean to you when I say run like a girl? It means run fast as you can. So do you think you just insulted your sister? No. I mean, yeah, insulted girls, but not my sister. Is like a girl a good thing? Actually, I don't know what it really, if it's a bad thing or a good thing. It sounds like a bad thing. Sounds like you're trying to humiliate someone. So when they're in that vulnerable time, between 10 and 12, how do you think it affects them when somebody uses like a girl as an insult? I think it definitely drops their self-confidence and um, really puts them down because during that time, they're already trying to figure themselves out. And when somebody says, you hit like a girl, it's like, well, what does that mean? Because they think they're a strong person, it's kind of like telling them that they're weak and they're not as good as them. 
And what advice do you have to young girls who are told they run like a girl, kick like a girl, hit like a girl, swing like a girl? Keep doing it, because it's working. If somebody else says that running like a girl, or kicking like a girl, or shooting like a girl is something that you shouldn't be doing, that's their problem. Because if you're still scoring, and you're still getting to the ball on time, and you're still being first, you're doing it right. It doesn't matter what they say. I mean, yes, I kick like a girl, and I swim like a girl, and I walk like a girl, and I wake up in the morning like a girl, because I am a girl. And that's not something that I should be ashamed of. So I'm gonna do it anyway. That's what they should do. If I asked you to, to run like a girl now, would you do it differently? I would run like myself. Would you like a chance to redo it? Yeah. Why can't run like a girl also mean win the race? To conclude, there are a number of strategies to deal with stereotypes and prejudices. The first and foremost thing to do is to acknowledge that they exist and have impacts on us, both positive and negative. We should call them out when they are deemed detrimental, and we should be ready to identify and face our own stereotypes and prejudices both towards ourselves and others. The second strategy is to focus on goals. Our brain can inhibit or suppress automatic stereotypes. And by giving ourselves a specific task that does not trigger stereotype-related information, we may bypass the automatic tendency to use them. The third strategy is to focus on the individuals. When we think about each person as unique, we can go beyond stereotypes. This is supported by coming more into contact with others, practice perspective-taking, empathy, and storytelling. The next strategy is to collect information. The less information we have, the more likely we are to rely on the automatic pattern of stereotypes. Another effective strategy is to use counter stereotypes. It is incredible that a very short exposure to images that don't fit our assumption can reduce our immediate activation of using stereotypes. Finally, as we see with the case of Toys R Us, we can choose the easy way by following stereotypes, by being the product of the culture. But we can also choose to be the producer of the culture, by promoting positive, and much needed changes for a better future. After all, we can be the change, that we want to see.